everybody to this discussion that we're here to talk about today, and that is the fastest growing sport in America, which is pickleball. That's just in the last three years, and that trend is definitely continuing forward. It is the third most popular sport behind running and biking, right? So it is really important that we're here to talk about movement and going into pickleball. Why is that? Well, because the age range is actually getting younger each year. Our biggest group of growth is in that 18 to 34 year olds are joining that pickleball explosion, right? It is becoming more competitive every single year. It was originally though designed so that everybody could play regardless of their physical ability. Now, that's where the problem therein lies with this pickleball pandemic. Everybody goes into this sport thinking it's a shorter court, um, it's less movement, but it is demanding on the body from a reactiveness, a responsiveness ability, and that's in here where we're seeing these medical issues come into play. It is in this year only, 2023, up to $500 million in medical costs have been attributed to pickleball injuries. And this is, you know, low back strains, rotator cuff strains. We had a, a Achilles rupture actually that I saw just the other day. We have all these injuries that are occurring because people are going out there and what's FMS's motto, move well so they can move often, right? They're not prepared to really respond, react, adapt to what the needs of pickleball are. Now, it is so popular that it's gonna be part of the Olympics in 2028 in Los Angeles. So this is something that's not going away. And this is a tremendous opportunity for health and fitness professionals to really stake their mark on helping these individuals stay active because that is our goal. It's not a bad thing that people are joining and growing and getting into this pickleball, this pandemic of injuries is where we really need to be concerned. It is our job to really help these individuals have a foundation so they can move better, so they can do the things that they love to do. Now, speaking of part of one of those statistics of pickleball, we're gonna send it over to Dr. Lee Burton and Greg Cook here. And Lee, you know, you were one of those statistics. You had a little bit of an injury and granted it was because of a fall, but you are part of this medical uh, cost statistic right there. And that's what brings us here today to really talk through this. So I'm gonna send it over to you guys to really introduce us to what happened and how we can really help people set the foundation so that we start to minimize these medical costs of pickleball. You know, Michelle, one of the things I'm gonna take some issue with is you said a lot of these injuries were caused of people lack some of the fundamentals, lack some of the things uh, that they need to play at high, an active sport like pickleball. Nah, with my athletic prowess, I was shocked I got injured. Um, all, ki no yeah, all kidding aside, I was the epitome, honestly, of what's occurring right now. I think pickleball is becoming such a popular sport. If you go back to what Michelle said, the people that are playing or that when it started, it was really about you know, hand-eye coordination, reaction time, not a lot of running around, not a lot of the, you know, going from baseline to baseline, what a typical tennis match would entail. Pickleball, because this court is smaller, you're supposed to play it maybe a little bit different. And believe me, I'm no pickleball expert, so I'm going to get into that story. And we started having, like a lot of these uh, communities do, pickleball nights. And me, <laughs> wanted to be active, wanted to do the things that, you know, all of us really want to be able to do. And certainly I exercise and I've caught film, believe I'm pretty active. I wanted to start playing. And I played tennis in the past. So me and one of my neighbors went out on one of these pickleball nights and we played. And this literally was back in September. I was the first time, maybe second, I think I went up and just banged it around one time um, with my son, didn't really play competitively. So this was the second time I actually played. And I think Michelle hit on something that that's important is I don't think it was when created was looked at to be a highly competitive sport. I think it was looked at as a way to get out there. It's more of a leisure activity just to kind of bang it back and forth. That's not what I was doing. I was playing with a friend of mine, a little older now, gray things don't move like they used to. I was playing it like you probably shouldn't be playing it. I was running from baseline to baseline. I was trying to slam it. I was doing everything and lo and behold, score was tied in the third match. So you had to do what you had I to do. I cannot lose. So I went after it. I went to the, to the side, tried to hit that baseline shot, and I planted. And when I planted, I slipped a little bit, fell back, fractured my wrist, which wrist injuries, one of the most common injuries you have. So it was due to a fall. It wasn't chronic, and we have a lot of chronic injuries. Uh, so, I, you know, I fractured my wrist. Going into that injury, quite honestly, I'm, I moved pretty well. 
Um, I don't have a lot of, you know, major dysfunctions, no pain, none of those major things. So I feel like with some rehab we're going to talk about here in a second that I bounce back pretty quick. It's been, you know, I think it's been eight, nine weeks now, got good range of motion, still limited a little bit in certain areas, but overall doing pretty well. But some of the things we talked about when we're doing this grade, obviously I got great to take a look at it. We did some taping. Um, we did some things to kind of align it up, right? Now, because it was a fracture, I kept it um, immobilized for, I don't know, Gray, I think, I, but think I left it immobilized a good three weeks. Three weeks before um, we started. Before, range. yeah, before Gray and I kind of started doing some basic range of motion. So I did, you know, what I was supposed to do, kind of left it immobilized and then um, went in and started doing some range of motion. I did, I did a real quick survey, not a screen. I, I had, my first question was, were you drinking? Um, which I was not, <laughs> okay, which, is, which is good. Well, good to know. Because second question, were you wearing court shoes instead of running shoes? Of course not. I was wearing. Okay. So those shoes. are two questions. You should, <laughs> there's a beer involved and there's some running shoes involved. So that's going to set you up for some balance and stability problems, even if you don't have any. The next two questions are specific to the FMS family. Do you have ones and do you have pain with movement? Nope. Good. So the risk factors of this happening were down, but the preparation, the skill, and maybe a level of competition that far exceeded your skill base is why we got here. Anyway, we had to do some rehab on these risks because now it's not about pickleball. And a long time ago, Greg Rose and I had the same conversation about golf. As soon as they're injured, it doesn't matter if they're golf or not. We're going to take an orthopedic strategic strike on impairments, limitations, mobility, and stability, rebuild that, then we're going back through the golf tunnel. And so we've got some really cool exercises that get people way more prepared for pickleball. But right now, he's still injured. So we got to get his wrist healthy. Getting it mobilized, taped up, stabilized. And instead of thinking wrist exercise here, we wanted to do things that promote joint health. And so if you're not in the rehab profession, believe it or not, simple distraction and compression of the joint at a level below the pain or where we get that reflexive stabilization to go. So what do we mean by that? Well, anything that's a carry is a distraction and anything that's a hang is a distraction and anything that's some degree of push, even if it's just partial weight, is compression. And believe it or not, Lee was actually diligent with those exercises. Yeah, so the, so the three exercises Grace talking about that I was doing on a, on a daily basis, sometimes even more than once a day, is we had the, the stall bars here as I was doing some distraction where I was doing some basic assisted squats and just hanging in this position for a period of time. And I think the, the thing that Gray mentioned that's very important, not to the level of pain. This was nothing I was doing was painful. Nothing I was doing was increasing my level of pain. It felt pretty good at the time. So that's one. And then, you know, we got the kettlebell and now I'm just doing some carries. I can just do some carries here. I wasn't doing any racked or, or, or overhead presses. I was just doing some carries for a period of time. Those are my two distractions. And after I did some distractions, I can go right in and do just some, some compression activities, again, with the stall bars, some type of elevation where I would do a little easy push-up. Those were two activities that were, were pretty straightforward and easy for me to do. Now, one thing on, on top of that, it's a wrist injury. So I was still exercising. And again, at my age, I'm over 50 now. I wasn't doing anything crazy, but I was still doing a lot of some of the stuff Gray's going to get into with lunges, with squats, split squats, things with my lower body. I was still able to do carries. I was doing, you know, 15 to 20 minute carries. So I had a little routine that I had along with my rehab. So one thing that, Gray, I think we get kind of, you know, backed into a corner with FMS is, you know, people assume that if you're in pain or you've got some type of ailment, you can't exercise. And it's just the opposite of that. There's a lot of things that even with my wrist injuries, I was able to do while I was, while I was letting that heal. And just so you know, this, the re central reason we're confident with exercising in, uh, in the presence of pain is a screen tells us which one of your movement patterns are causing pain. Wrist range of motion caused you pain but wrist compression and distraction didn't. When we compress and distract a joint, it actually sends a signal right to the stabilizers before it even goes back to your brain and does what I said before, reflex stabilization. So for those of you who like static exercise before dynamic, that's another way of saying the same thing. We're teaching the joint how to be neutral and handle loads of compression and distraction long before we worry about pronation, supination, flexion, and extension. And we slowly work that second. A lot of people, even in rehab, get on that range of motion first and leave some stability behind. And then all of a sudden we got an upset and a setback. 
I knew where I was headed with Lee all along because ultimately, if you went back to last month when we did a bunch of chops and lifts, we've got a few key movements that are assets in racket sports. And long before I wrote Athletic Body and Balance, I actually partnered up with a tennis pro and wrote a book in tennis just because I was with Reebok at the time working on a lot of their pro tennis players. And it goes back to those fundamental patterns. Most people want to train a racket or club sport and just start making things look like the swing that you're doing and I try to make it look like the movement patterns that give you power. So we train golf, tennis, pickleball, all of it from the ground up. And one thing that I've learned in tennis is people will play with what we call an open stance working off a symmetrical squat stance exercises help here or what we call a closed stance which is a little bit more of a lunge rotation situation. Both are good, both are suited to a style. You have a lot more power in a closed stance, but now I'm committed to that direction, so I could be slow going this way. I have a lot more options here, but now the shoulder, the wrist, and the elbow are a little bit more vulnerable to torque. We want to teach both those. So by rebuilding the squat and lunge, both of which we could have been doing while your wrist is recovering, we get the lower body ready for more options and as we noticed in tennis, there was a lot of speed development programs in tennis back early in my career, but the injuries occur in deceleration and direction change. And so if we don't somehow do a little bit of that in people who are motivated to play pickleball and motivated to do any fitness that enhances that ability, sustainability well and often we're going to do. So what we've done is we've picked a few key exercises that if you've got pickleball people that can't do these, do whatever you can on the mobility and stability spectrum to get them doing these as quick as possible. And if we've got somebody coming off an injury, the first thing I want to see is Lee, can you do these exercises without a problem? And can you appreciate maybe left, right differences or why you're good in some exercises and not the other? Therefore, we can prioritize the movement patterns for your game. So one thing that we've got to mention as we go into some, to showing some of these exercises, as Michelle rattle off the stats, rattle off the age ranges of people who are playing, we as, as fitness healthcare professionals are going to see people that are coming in that are play, that we're going to see people that are coming in, whether injured, non-injured, play. We've got to set the stage so we know what exercises are most appropriate. And that's where screening comes in. Does a person have an underlying mobility problem? Does a person have an underlying stability problem? Because that's going to help direct what we then need to do. Because if a person that is 60 year old is getting ready to go out and play pickleball and they've got some limitations in their mobility, we've got to attack that and address that. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we go through some of these things. Some of these will, will actually attack both, but we've got to make sure that we've got that and we know what's going to help the person out the most. And as Grace said, it's not just about mimicking the sport and doing what a lot of people have deemed functional exercise by just strapping a band on a racket and swinging it because that actually could create more problems no, you're, you're than it two, helps. You're two clicks away on the internet from seeing a pickleball racket tied to a rubber band and somebody looking like a, a robot. That, that's been around in golf, tennis, baseball for a long time. Take the handle that you're pulling on in the sport, tie something to it and think you're doing something. That's not where we're coming from. So whether people are coming to pickleball from competitive tennis, or whether people are coming to pickleball because even though they're sedentary, they actually are invigorated to get out there and do it. You're going to find movement screen problems. We don't find great movement screens at the NFL combine, and we don't find great movement screens at the nursing home. So you've got a different reason for having movement screens, but an asymmetrical sport like golf or tennis is going to leave you with movement problems as well. So we're screening everybody coming to it, but ultimately for pickleball, you will wind back up using one of these exercises to get them ready. And if their screen gives them a little difficulty here, this is where you're aiming for. So after your wrist, we were aiming for a few key moves. And uh, you want to- Where are they? Yeah, All right. let's talk about them. I so, wanna go ahead. Uh, one thing that the chops and lifts that Gray mentioned earlier was one of the first things I started doing once I felt the healing was where it needed to be. Six, six weeks or so into it, I started doing some of these chops and lifts, half kneeling and half kneeling for me because the screen, I've got a little asymmetry in my body. I've, so lunges and half kneeling activities are better. Even half kneeling turns is that distraction. So we started doing some chops and lifts pretty early on. Now, a lot of people want to do this in standing, and that's fine, and you can stagger your stance, but I find we can really get a narrow stance. So, Lee, go ahead and down on one knee, 
bring that foot around all the way to the box there, narrow your stance, and then just reach up and pull down and across. So if you notice, that wrist is pretty much neutral flex and extension, but we're doing a lot of pronation supination. You had it right. You had it right. Chop into the yep. up knee? No, you're doing you get, Grab the low one. I'm sorry. Yeah, grab, yeah. grab the low one. Yeah, we're, um, we're, we're lifting. We see this is live. <laughs> Now, we're pulling from the bottom, and when you have to choose, especially pickleball and tennis, chop or lift, um, we're going to go lift first. It's going to be a down to up. It's going to be posturally correct. You're going to use lighter weights, but it's also going to have a range of motion advantage. Now, the first thing I want Lee to know, can you get through the pattern without wrist pain? So let's just go up and through. It's a pull to a push. Should have no wrist pain here. So we're gonna rep out a few, making sure his base is narrow, his posture is good, and we're gonna shoot for a mark up here in the air, and there you go, he's fine. Now, the first thing I wanna do is just let Lee do a rep out. Feel comfortable with it, maybe at 12 or 15. I want him to immediately about face, face the other direction, and let me know, does it feel the same or different? This is where, as a trainer, I'm gonna capitalize on this left-right asymmetry and say, don't bring this to the court, okay? So he's nice and smooth there. He's got some awareness. He's gonna turn around and do the mirror image movement. And if you don't capitalize on this opportunity right here, you're gonna miss the beauty of doing these lifts. Now, if you're noticing a little bit of difficulty- Much more difficult in this position. Okay. This not so, because of my wrist. Not because of his wrist. Lee had, had fractured a hip a long time ago as a kid. He's always had left, right asymmetries. And so we're going to work out Lee's core in a very pickleball, racket sport specific way. Would planks do the same thing? Statically, but not dynamically. So number one, you already know I need an extra two sets of lifts on this side is the other side. Set your baseline. Now, I also want to see a single leg deadlift. Why this? Why, why, why are we putting this down? <clears throat> Some people can't go all the way to the ground and a lot of people, now all the way to the ground, go more weight and do an even better lift. But I don't need full range of motion to benefit from the stability in this. There's a lot of people who can't go that low. So. And you notice what Gray's got me doing here in this position, a lot of questions we get, what about the knee? Well, right now, I'm actually, the weight is being distributed across my shin. So the, the stress on the knee is minimal in this position. So that's one thing to add in. Yes, it is. And the second thing is you can't really see it, but so many people set up for chops and lifts and, and they're wide doing that. And the essence of what we're doing and by having that is I can get Lee to narrow down. So he really has to use his core and his stability to do this thing. So when he's coming up and across, he's throwing himself off balance and having to recover in motion and that's really what we do so i don't mind if people start with a light weight and a wide base and a lift if they need it but we're constantly going to narrow base full range of motion and a nice strong symmetrical lift that's where we're headed it might take a year to get there but you've got to be aiming for that so you mentioned the the, the um, deadlifts next gray so now this is another activity i added in early on this is also a distraction for my wrist if you think about it even with me using the band here so now as I go back, do a single leg, let the weight pull me, and then pull it back and through, making sure you're not letting those shoulders flex out. But again, another activity I could do early on in my rehab for my wrist, getting myself up nice and tall, slide that foot back, let the band go forward, keep my shoulders tight, and then push through. One thing here, I'm not really concerned about Lee's range of motion. I do want to make sure he's doing it all on one leg. He's holding a neutral spine. The range of motion isn't that much, but this is a great way just to challenge balance, okay? Now, we can do it with a lot of different devices, but since we're going to use the bands and they're non-threatening, it's going to give us that. But what I want you to really look at here is left-right differences, once again. I have a lot of people who aren't ready for squats and lunges right away because they don't want to bend their knee that much, and there's a reason for that. And usually, whether I've got patellofemoral problems in teenagers or arthritic knee problems in older people, their weak hip is exploiting their knee, and we can get your hip strong before we ask you to bend your knee too much here. And if, once again, like the chop and lift, if there's a big difference, I need you to close that gap. That's your homework. And one thing to, to consider here with, with me, I've got both hands on the band, which is basically not giving me a rot rotary component. If I put the bands in one hand and go back now, it's creating a lot of rotation. That would also, that would actually be a progression. This is a little bit easier, even though you can argue it's more resistance, the resistance is straight. 
As soon as I put the band in one hand, now it creates a lot of imbalance. So that would be a progression in this example. No, I think that's a good point because if you're not even hinging equally, why would you want to hinge and rotate and control 3D? Because what Lee's actually speaking about is something that's very popular in rotational sports We're breaking it down. It's anti-rotation, it's derotation, it's the deceleration that makes the golf swing snap and the tennis serve really, really stripe a ball. Now, if we have gotten rid of some of those lift asymmetries and maybe worked them all the way to standing and some of those single leg deadlift asymmetries, I really want Lee to get comfortable with lunges. And we're going to take off our strength coach hat right now because three sets of 10 don't exist no more. How long does pickleball last? Way longer than that. Yeah. So I'm going to make his lunge easy. As a matter of fact, Lee's going to have the same effect as if he were that deep in a pool right now because as he lunges out, this bungee cord gives him more assistance the lower he goes. Now he can rep out one side and see how that feels. So go ahead and give me five or six on one side. Step about the same place, stride it out a little bit more. No spine movement. We do not want to see the head bobbing. He shouldn't have to because we're making the lunge easy and the hardest point. One other thing that a lot of people have is they don't use enough of their ankle and calf in this. Now Lee's got some great big old calves, so he's probably using his. But simply just giving Lee a uh, dorsiflexion stretch and a plantar flexion post off actually could refine and make his lunge better. So set that up, step out into a heel down dorsiflex position. And some people with a small ramp or a small toe lift will feel much more comfortable in the lunge. And that was the missing piece. Too much knee, not enough ankle. If that doesn't make a difference, all I need you to do is get both your lunges equal. And because I made it assistive, there's no reason why you can't watch your favorite TV show and clip out 40 of these, not four. So we're really getting those joints lubricated and those that center of gravity used to going low. You won't use all of that in pickleball. You'll have reserve in every direction you play. And I definitely have an asymmetry, Gray, going out with this right. And that actually showed up in the chop. So I know that asymmetry is coming, coming out. And again, same thing with pickleball. That deceleration that I got into is what created it. And I will guarantee you some of that asymmetry I've got may have led to that inability to kind of slow myself down to keep myself from slipping and falling back. Now, one rule I made for myself long ago, working with the highest caliber tennis in, in the world at the time was I wasn't really worried about somebody's squat if they had a left right lunge difference. So Lee, I'm very comfortable with you working out the three asymmetries we may have exposed before I show you how to really load up the core integrity in that squat. But let's fast forward about three weeks and assume that you did what you're supposed to well, do. One thing before we do that, Gray, I've seen this option be an option as well, where you actually extend your arms out and it's still the assisted technique, but now what does this do? It's, it's popped me in the head. It's a great option because now what Lee did is took the, the, the pull from his waist, transferred it up through his torso. So how we talked about anti-rotation exercise at chop and lift, this is an anti-extension exercise in the low back. So believe it or not, we could also load one side and be able to do that or both sides. But if Lee had resolved some of his asymmetries and I really wanted to lock them in, just like the FMS, we're always going to finish with that squat. And believe it or not, this is going to look like a resisted move, but it's like giving somebody a heel lift in their squat because of that activation that it's going to create. So I'm going to get Lee basically just to put these on his shoulders. All right. And the reason we go hands up or hands partial or something like that is Lee is now being pulled forward. So all his weight is shifted to his toes. So in essence, Lee can lean back in his squat a little bit almost as if he had a heel lift. But if he leans back too far, he's gonna fall. So I'm gonna spot him the first time he does this and say, your torso's vertical, and now you can just train the squat. Now, if we came here with an asymmetry in his lift, his single leg deadlift or his lunge, we would probably see him doing some unnecessary rotation, unnecessary torque, valgus collapse, pronation, or spinning out. But if we were to work that through and be patient, we can actually put the icing on the cake and get some good cardio interval right here with that squat. And if we've opened up Lee's squat pattern a little bit more and made his lunges more symmetrical, he has two options with pickleball now to use his lower body in a closed, coiled position or in a very adaptable open position. And we just saved him a step, but we also protected your balance. Yeah. So. And for me, knowing my background, knowing my screen, 
I don't have a really a mobility problem. I've got more of a motor control. And again, that asymmetry comes into play. So much more on the split stance activities is what I need to focus on. Less about mobility, but a lot of these little really quick activities, 15 to 20 minutes. We're talking about great. We're not talking about a lot of time. No, no. And, and, and a small version of these would be the perfect warm up because in my early days in tennis, I didn't have a gym everywhere I went with professional tennis players. We were hanging this stuff on the fence and simply polishing that bad lift you got or waking up that sort of lazy lunge that you have as a warm up right before the thing because there's a competitive advantage there. Just doing a stretch before you play is not necessarily the only thing. What about the Indian club? So now once I get on the other side of this injury, Adding in some Indian club basic moves could be a good way for maintenance, but also, especially get some slams and some swings to add in that little plyometric effect. We've got so much Indian club information up on YouTube, and we've even got a course in Indian clubs. But the one thing that hit me like a ton of bricks working with racket and club sports is motor learning usually helps best at or near the speed of competition. So we are left with medicine balls and Indian clubs that actually move as fast as a club or a racket. So once we've got that fundamental base, because 90% of what we did here was to create the roots of the tree and we're going to let the limbs do what they do with that good root system, not compensate for it. But getting a little bit of velocity, getting some of the basic patterns, like Lee said, or even some of the more complicated shoulder health patterns, it's a great place to put people. And believe it or not, by changing your stance in your base, we get balance and movement quickness in the upper body. So clubs come from club fighting and sword fighting, but there's so much carryover for people who throw and swing implements that it's amazing. And just, just, co just coach me through, Greg, because I think the, the, the two moves that I think would be good are, are the swings and the slams because they're easy to do, but you got to have the good foundation first. Right. So the one thing I'll do is, is with that half kneeling, you can actually do a just just swing it through, lift it up. So just getting sort of a little bit of a ballistic stretch. Now, I'm saying this in the future is if he's already done his chops and lifts, but just learning, see that natural rocking motion he's doing? Now switch your legs, Lee, and just swing it the other way. If you're still noticing a difference, yeah, there you go. And if you feel a little awkward on one side than the other, then that's a good work through. So if you've got the range of motion to do that and you've done the homework to do that, that's a great way to lock it in. When we come up here, we basically can cross at the top and open at the bottom. And slamming those clubs down, once again, creates that momentum. And you see an energy transfer. His heels are floating, not because I told him to plantar flex. His heels are floating because he threw energy into the floor and his body threw it back up. The, and, and for me, I would want to do this split stance position for the same reason we exactly, talked about the lunch. Exactly. So that's all in our club's program. But the other one is just like a kettlebell swing, but for some of your clients and some of your people playing pickleball, pickleball if they never touch a kettlebell, just opening that X to the top. And so if you notice, there's like a pane of glass right here. And so I have Lee hip hinging way more than squatting and quickly unleashing that. So he's going from a universal ready position of reaction to an explosion and just letting his arms transfer the energy. And so we don't wanna see people be robotic and thinking of this as a front lift. Those clubs are made to be swung. And here's what I mean by that. There's a small amount of acceleration at the beginning and a free ride to the top. And most people are trying to lift those clubs all the way to the ceiling. You don't have to flick them hard, ride them to the top, bring them down quick. So these movements are a way to take a little bit more of a ballistic neurological preparation. And you can do it with med balls, but clubs are way more specific. You can do it with kettlebells, but clubs are way safer for people who aren't into that. So there's a great advantage to be gained here once you build your base. Yeah, and you should see, Gray, I'm a little winded by just doing that little bit of club work. So another good thing to add in, even is like a little circuit that we just went through. And again, I can't talk very much now after doing just that little 
30 seconds right there. The only other two things I could say is you had your injury without alcohol, so you may want to have a <laughs> beer first, and you may want to get some court shoes. And that's one thing I would say. If you're in an athletic training, strength conditioning, or rehab role, and you're talking to somebody in pickleball, just make sure the shoes that they vacuum in or the ones they walk in maybe aren't the ones. Because if you're on a court and you are specifically doing deceleration direction change, you want an appropriate tread. You want a little bit more integrity to the ground. You want to feel that heel more of a neutral shoe usually works better for most people um, in a court sport. And so. the one thing, Michelle touched on this, we don't want to discourage people from doing these types of activities, even though there's injuries, a lot, I mean, the more we can get people out there doing things actively, the better. We just got to make sure that we give them the right awareness so they know where their limitations are. Hey, don't go around like Lee did and try to be, you know, um, Andre Agassi doing baseline shots. Stay in the middle, do react and do what, do what it's really meant to do get the right foundation first in your training. So give them that awareness, give them that education to put on top of some exercise you may want to give them, but we certainly don't want to discourage anybody from being out there and getting active. And one last thing, you're going to have two conversations like we had today with somebody in pickleball. Either they're going to have an injury and they don't want to have it again, so here's your opportunity, or you're in a position where you can maybe talk to a pickleball club and say, if we did some proactive screening, we could probably give you a competitive advantage because not being able to play lets everybody get better quicker than you in the same amount of time. So the, the proactive statement is let us screen you, let us talk to you about these fundamental exercises. Some of you will need to do some basic mobility and stability just to get ready for this. Some of you may need a little soft tissue. Doesn't matter. If we can get you to these exercises, your risk factors went down because most of the pickleball injuries, let's remember this, aren't because pickleball is a bad sport. It's because bad screens try to play pickleball. So let's kick it over to Michelle to see if you guys have any questions for us. Yep. Thanks, Lee and Gray. And Lee, I certainly didn't mean to offend your athletic proudness. Obviously, you're in a different category than, you know, the general population that we're talking about right now. But just a question that came in is what about those individuals who, um, you know, maybe don't have the screen scores that you have, Lee, that maybe have those ones or those asymmetries with one, two? Um, what would you give recommendations for our fitness and health professionals that are working with those individuals, um, getting people, because obviously we don't want to discourage them from playing, but how do we start to navigate that conversation between the correctives and maintaining that pickleball um, opportunity. Is that you? Is that, so, so make sure, because I, I, Gary and I were talking about Michelle. So yeah, so basically if a person does have some significant limitations or dysfunctions, how do we go about that? And I think it goes back to, you know, get them down, get the foundation first. If they've got limitations saying they're up, let's just talk about upper body mobility being the, the probably the most common one. They've got some shoulder mobility restrictions. We certainly want to give them some activities that's going to focus on improving shoulder mobility, thoracic spine mobility, plenty of those options working. You know, we got one rib grab, so get the T-spine moving. So activities are going to help their upper body, not just their shoulder. We got to get their upper body moving. But we got to do that with some specific specific activities to improve thoracic spine mobility or upper body mobility, but then go right into the chops and lifts. Go, you know, put that right on top of it because that'll help set that, set that foundation a little bit better. And then, as I said, we don't necessarily want to say they can't play, but just knowing that you've got this limitation in this area, hey, maybe just not do as much running around the court. Maybe try to just to do a little bit more dinking and dunking that I should have been doing. Well, the other, the other thing that, that I want to add to that is there are people that can't get into certain moves because of pain. So the very first thing we learn in screening or we learn in a history is I got pain in my left knee if I do too much. Well, that's a completely different problem than a mobility or stability problem. So when you screen or have these conversations, you're going to wind up with one of three things. A pain problem that we're going to go under and look for mobility and stability assets to make that better or you're just gonna have a mobility or stability problem. And some of the basic flows and some of the pieces of those flows we put on the internet for mobility and stability are a starting point to maybe get that one a little bit ready to train a little bit harder. Once again, we're simply looking for exercises that magnify the left-right asymmetry or the one side and see that incremental progress and do everything we can to support that so it doesn't backslide. But once again, the same thing that you're doing at home for homework and a corrective becomes in a little capsule the best warm-up you could possibly do because if you can upgrade somebody's balance 10% 10, 10 before they play, that's huge. 
right? We didn't have that opportunity with, with Lee. But had we had a chance to do it, you'd know if it's a good day for your balance or not, and you may play, change your play or options differently. So take pain off the table because you can't train through pain and get the pattern to stick. It just won't happen. We've tried. Don't do it. But then you're underlying, you're going to find mobile instability problems. And each of these has some good Foam roll, stretch, do a flow, but don't just create mobility and be satisfied. You've got to test stability every time. And what we find is a lot of people playing pickleball right now don't even do good on a 12 foot balance beam. They fall off three times. Well, what if they did that five minutes before they played? Would that upgrade the neurological system, increase the base of support over the center of mass and stuff like that? Probably. So there's some fundamental stuff we can do for flexibility and balance, but get pain off the table because a lot of these people are playing around pain, not knowing where it's coming from. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Now, Greg, here's a question for you. You showed us um, a lunge exercise by putting the foam roller underneath Lee's angle to increase that dorsiflexion. The question that came in is, when would it be appropriate to move to that progression? Is it something we start with, or how do you make that decision to add that foam roller in? Decision because I've already made the lunge easier and Lee still had a little bit of difficulty on one side. I wanted to make sure that was a singular problem on one side instead of just the fact that, like me, I don't use my calf as well in deceleration. I try to do it all with my hips. The minute you give me any amount of extra dorsiflexion, it triggers. Any questions? I'm not sure I have any. It just triggers a posterior chain reaction for me. So when you see somebody get significantly better just by getting that little ramp for their lunge, let them have it and then wean them off of it with less enough. It didn't help him as much as it helps me, but I wanted you to have that option. We already had a left right asymmetry without that. If that made my left right asymmetry go away, I would know it had a lot more to do with the way I'm using my ankle in my lunge than the way I'm using my hip. And Gray, my... what you're describing is really about creating a little bit more activation. A absolutely. It's a, it's a posterior chain activation that I can't tell you to do, right. but the minute your calf gets a two inch more stretch, your glutes, your lats, your spinal erectors, everything becomes involved. And so you've basically got a flat footed person or not. And I'm a very flat footed person that enhances my lunge. And then all I got to do is learn how to lunge without that. All you got to do is learn how to lunge better on one side. You don't need that. And the one thing Gray mentioned, just to reiterate, is lower it down. Like this is a significant, this is almost three inches in height. Go ahead and, you know, after you do a few reps or set, lower that thing down to maybe a 25 pound plate, 10 pound plate. So gradually lower it down. Yep. Pick something that won't slip. Use a wedge. We've, we've used a lot of different things um, to do that. It can't move. It's got to be somewhat uh, friction to the floor. And and any degree of a little toe lift does enhance it for some people. And the indication is they're not lunging with a complete situation. They're doing it with a knee strategy. And, and I think we get that a lot in fitness by just doing a bunch of walking lunges and not doing any real deceleration like you use in life. And I think too often, especially in our profession, we try to cue them through that. No, don't cue them. Yeah. We, yeah. You, you want them just to naturally feel it. So they can automatically respond to that. And I think that's a big problem in our profession. We have a tendency, you know, hey, push off, do this, do that. Hey, just create a little obstacle and just let them work themselves through it. Well, the one thing we, we really try to prize in our exercises is creating awareness first and foremost. And so if we can create a left-right awareness, then you know what gap you're closing. Because as Lee said, you're not going to be there when they're playing pickleball as a line judge telling them to activate their glutes. So don't even bring that to your exercise. Let somebody else do that. All right, you guys, last question for you that just came in is, would ankle mobility drills on the half foam roller, like the balance deep squat in the single leg around the world progression, be a good suggestion for a warm-up routine when somebody goes out to play pickleball? Definitely, but I would say before you even involve the band, if they're having difficulty with something as simple as a mobility flow, which is doing the exact same foam roll, but without any of this extra fanfare, get through that first and then bring this and the band together and you get even more sport specific. But that basic mobility flow is designed for balance and cleaning up ankles and core that you're getting ready to bring. It's a good warm up for this stuff and then blend the two together with a little of both. Awesome. Well, thank you, Lee and Gray, for sharing all that information and helping us actually be on the forefront of fitness and healthcare professionals of getting people ready to go out and do the things that they love to do, that pickleball, right? Because we certainly don't want to take that away from people. It is getting people active. But as we wrap this up, any final thoughts for everybody watching um, this with us today? 
Well, I, I just want to thank Dr. Burton for donating his body to science and uh, a little bit of probing today. He's definitely eaten his slice of humble pie and come back out swinging again. So yeah, not not really. I've been out there playing pickleball again. Uh, a <laughs> little bit different, a little bit different technique. Again, technique is part of the part of the thing. We got to create some awareness and education. But I think if people are out there being active, that's a positive, especially with all the problems we're having. We and Michelle just kind of said it. We've got to be at the forefront of that. We, and Gray even said it. Get out there in your community. We know people are playing. We know these things are popping up everywhere. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to just get out there, be part of be part of the solution. Get in front of these people. Maybe do just a presentation or something. Uh, but it doesn't have to be overly complicated. There's a few basic moves here that help that foundation start implementing some of those even in a group situation and you'll have some positive benefits from that one other thing those of you who are logging in we know you're professionals we know you're the cream of the crop and we know you're truly interested in unpacking problems not just throwing out band-aids as you watch what happens with this pandemic as michelle said and more and more popularity you're going to see everything wrong in the fitness side of that as well and I'd like you to compare some of the infomercials you're going to see in the future to the way we tried to unpack it here. Be part of this and you'll get the movement at the beginning of the problem, not on the backside of it. Thanks, guys. Again, appreciate your expertise and insight into how we can start to affect change to help people continue to do the things that they love to do. And that's our goal at Functional Movement Systems, to set that foundation to keep people active, especially as they go into their aging years. We certainly want people to go out, do the things that they love to do, but we want to keep them safe as possible. And remember, we can't reduce completely the risk of injury. It can happen, but we can set that person up for success to be able to respond to those outside stimuli. That is the foundation at Functional Movement Systems. Now, if you weren't aware or you haven't already taken advantage, we do have a sale going on on our online and our virtual courses. 40% off, that sale's been extended till December 1st. That's the biggest sale of our year. So please take advantage of that if you'd like to join our FMS family or if you'd like to continue your journey through our FMS education. We'd love to have you into these courses so that we can further have these conversations and again, prepare you to be at the forefront of helping change movement throughout the world. We want people to stay active. We just want them to do it in a safe way and allow them as they're aging years to age gracefully, right? All right, guys, so thank you so much for joining us today. Obviously, we're always here to answer your questions, so please don't hesitate to ask us. It's at support at functionalmovement.com. We're here to support you as you go through your movement journey. Thanks, everybody, and until next time, move well, move often.